Hey there, thank you so much for joining us for our um, webinar series. You've, uh, this group you've seen before and we're happy to be back with you again after a little bit of a break and a busy fall. I'm Barry Norman and um, we're gonna be talking about admissions and testing in a post pandemic world tonight, answering questions that came in um, beforehand and also ones that are submitted live. And just a few housekeeping notes, if you do want to submit questions as we're speaking, please do it in the Q&A um, section of the chat. So I'm, without further ado, I'm gonna pass it to our moderator, Leslie Singer. Hi, so I'm Leslie Singer from Brown Harris Stevens and I'm always thrilled to do this evening with both Barry Norman and we have Sasha DeWin from Tudor Associates. So we have two amazing experts. Um, I always like to also start this evening by trying to understand who is part participating. So we'd like to do a poll in terms of, do we have freshmen, sophomore, what grade are you in? This helps us direct questions and, and also our answers so we know. We've got people still answering. So we'll give everybody a few more seconds. All right, it looks like we have mostly 11th graders, 44% 11th graders, 20% 12th graders, 11% um, 9th graders, and 5% 10th graders. It just moved a little bit, a couple more people answered, but um, we're basically mostly 11th graders followed by 12th, followed by 9th, followed by 10th. So thank you, everybody. Well, I'm gonna just jump in and I do have notes. So if I'm looking down, please excuse me, but um, I'm gonna start with Sasha. And Sasha, for, especially for these 11th graders, are kids testing? And let, let's start with that, are kids testing? They are. Um, I'm actually happy to say they're testing. They're actually relieved for the first time to be testing. We didn't think we would be saying that, but after a year of so many test cancellations, um, we're really relieved to just have some stability um, with our test centers. And so our juniors are um, the early ones have tested, but most of them are gearing up to test. It's still really early in the testing season. Um, and our seniors were all able, our current seniors were all able to test um, mm -hmm. and had the relief of not doing the subject test this fall. So they really kind of are, were done and are done. Um, and so, yeah, we're happy to be back at it. Amazing. Um, for those who are just starting to figure out the testing, how do you know if you're an ACT or if you're an SAT? Yeah, I mean, in broad strokes, I really do think of these as similar tests. I mean, they're sort of different in their particularities, but I do think, generally speaking, they test reading comprehension, they test grammar skills, they test math, and they do it in a standardized fashion, right, with their own sort of rules. And so um, the sort of easy thing to do is to really try a full SAT and a full ACT and find out if you're an SAT kid or an ACT kid. Um, but I will say that um, the ACT is a test that asks students to go quite quickly. Um, and so kids always come out of it and say, I didn't finish, I didn't finish, which I just say, yeah, well, no one finishes their diagnostics. And the SAT, um, people don't usually complain so much about the timing, but they go, oh, it was a little tricky. I didn't know how I did it. I just have no idea how I did. Um, and so it, I like to think of the ACT as maybe a little more predictable, but not always in a way that kids love. And I think the VSAT is maybe a little bit less predictable, um, but, but suited to some kids' strains, certainly. And so really, we just like to look at these tests in their full length forms and really dig in. And sometimes it's very obvious which way you should go. And sometimes a student has accommodations that really, really suggest one test better than the other. Sometimes all things are equal and we dig in a little and try to figure out the right one based on some other parameters like scheduling or a kid's preference. I think also just to add something really quickly is that um, sometimes students are looking like just comparing scores and take uh, an equivalency table and say, oh, this score was higher, this is lower. But it's so important to have somebody like Sasha who really knows the test and isn't just looking at scores and comparing them because it may just be like a timing thing, which they can easily address, for instance. Instance. Like you have to look at what you got wrong, what types of questions, how coachable are they, where, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses. There's so many 
little pieces that go into deciding which score, which test is best for you. It's not just about comparing the scores and saying, oh, this one I started out so much higher or whatever. So it yeah. really is something you should treat with a lot of care because you really should focus on one or the other and stick with it and you know be in it for the long haul and you want to get it right at the outset instead of being somebody who realizes you know halfway or three quarters into your tutoring oh you know what I should switch tests um so get it kind of get it right at the, at the start yeah Barry thank you I, I agree I think that I've had too many kids come to me having done SAT for way too long with someone else and ACT really always should have been the thing but there was something discouraging at the beginning I like to say we start with the what that's the scores sort of like that is the lining them up then we dig into the why and the why is it ranges right from I didn't actually eat at all uh, preceding the ACT and I ate breakfast before the SAT you know you really have to dig into the why um, and then as Barry said, you can start to really figure out what it is that needs to move. There are different categories of things that need to be um, addressed and adjusted to move those scores up and, and digging into the why behind the what is essential if you're going to map out that plan. Yeah. And even when they are equivalent, let's say Sasha says, you know what, they really are the same. Sometimes from an admissions perspective, I'll prefer one over the other because one will take us farther, so to speak, even though they're technically equivalent scores. And it depends on where you are and where you're shooting for. Um, and so all of these things should be taken into account before you commit to one test versus the other. So we are talking about both the ACT and the SAT, but can you talk about test optional? Is that gonna be here to stay? So maybe we don't need to be taking the ACT or the SAT. Yeah, so. I'll, I'll <laughs> jump in first and then I'll let Barry, Barry's gonna talk sort of more about the statistics. I know she's prepared a lot for that. I'll just say in broad strokes, like test optional really hasn't shifted anything for my kids. I, I know it has shifted things nationally. Um, I know it is part of a larger conversation um, and there are lots of things sort of coming in the sort of test optional space in the coming years. But for our kids, um, all it has really done is appropriately allow the kids who really shouldn't have been spending so much time and effort on these tests for whatever reason to bow out. And the vast majority of our kids who we're going to test are testing. It's a benefit to their application. It makes sense for them. Um, so for my group of kids, test optional really means send amazing scores and they do. Um, but certainly Barry can speak to sort of the, the bigger picture. Yeah, I mean, bigger picture, we've got about two thirds of colleges this year test optional. You know, that is definitely the case, but whether or not test optional is right for you is a whole other story. And again, it depends on your profile. It depends on where you're shooting for. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. And we did get a question about some stats and I pulled a few things just because I know it's helpful to hear numbers. But at the same time, like, I don't really care what the numbers are. Like, I don't care what the stat is. I mean, some of them actually you can really dig a little bit and you get a little bit of info from, but it's really what happens in, in real time, right? What's gonna actually happen? Cause they can, we know that numbers can tell all different stories depending on what you wanna tell. Um, but, but how does it impact you individually as a student? From our perspective, if you can give scores, it's to your benefit. You'll be able to predict better what's going to happen and you'll generally increase your chances for admission, period. Um, and so we don't want students to think about test optional as like, oh good, I get a pass because it's optional, the colleges don't really care about them. That's not what it means. It is giving flexibility to certain students that wouldn't have had a fighting chance before because even though they wouldn't say it at the time, we always have said and we've always known that high scores don't necessarily get you in, but relatively low scores for a school will absolutely keep you out. And we've always been very direct and forward about that, regardless of the messaging from the colleges. So now you actually do have some students who, when the, only the scores would have kept them out, they actually have a chance to be admitted. Do they have a good chance, a better, do they have a better chance than before, but it doesn't mean that suddenly their chances are good. Um, the way that I look at it is that you try, you act as if it's not test optional, you give it your best shot. If it's clear after a certain point that you're not going to be able to hit a certain point or that things, you know, are not going to land where they need to land so much so that it will knock you out. Maybe it would make sense to stop and, you know, we discuss what the options might be. And we did have some students last year that landed in that space and they were able to get into schools they wouldn't have gotten into before test optional was there. But I would say it's never 
plan A. It's always plan B. Um, and so again, to your advantage to do so, the more selective the school, the more likely the scores will be to your advantage. Um, but the truth is, is it's helpful really across the board. Uh, speaking of um, selective schools, et cetera, um, sorry, along with the testing, for our seniors, I'm sure a lot of people have uh, want to know this question. Do you think that applications are going to be, are there going to be more applications for selective schools this year or less than last? You know, what is your take on that? You know, it's anybody's guess, obviously, but my expectation is that they'll continue to go up. Um, we knew that they were going to skyrocket. We said that pre, uh, long before the numbers came in on these webinars, I said, like, expect the numbers to go through the roof. And they did. Um, the application numbers went down. The admit rates plummeted. I don't think you're going to see as big a spike between last year and this year, but I would expect that generally speaking, we're going to continue to see things creep up or at least stay around the same. Do you want to talk about the statistics you mentioned you did poll statistics? Is that a good, is a good yeah, time absolutely, to do that? Yeah, absolutely. We, we got some questions about kind of just test optional numbers for some of the more selective schools. And I pulled, um, I, I mean, there's so, there's so many statistics to pull and I wanted just to grab a little bit. Um, there was the question particularly about highly selectives. And um, so for instance, Penn, 75% of the admitted class were submitters. At Georgetown, 89% were submitters. Um, that says a lot. Now with Georgetown, they're very clear, even in the, in the first pandemic year, they were clear that they wanted scores, ideally. And on their application, if you don't submit scores, they actually ask you to tell them why you weren't able to submit them. So this is a test optional place that's being very clear that you know, you, you better have a good reason in their eyes that why you didn't take it if you didn't take it. Um, Penn doesn't have anything like that on their application. It's just a test optional school, but you can see that obviously most kids being admitted um, are submitting scores. There are other places where it's held a little bit different picture. So at Vanderbilt, um, there was an admit rate for students admitted with scores was, was 7.2%. The admit rate for students admitted without scores 6.0 percent. So there you're seeing more of an even. Obviously, it's a little bit more even, but the, we don't know as far as like who are the students that make up the group that were admitted with scores, who did not. What did the people who weren't admitted that didn't submit scores? What did they? You know, there's so much information that's missing from this. For those of you who go to Navian schools, you know the scattergrams are instructive but they have less information than they have information, right? We see SAT or ACT scores, we see GPA, we know nothing about the rigor of the curriculum. We know nothing about what the grades are that made up that GPA. Was it straight Bs? Was it at all As and one B minus? Um, did it include the ceramics classes or not? Were they an athlete? Were they in a, leg a legacy? Were they an underrepresented group? Like we have so little information and I would say with all of these statistics, the same thing is that, yes, they, it's somewhat instructive, but there's so much more to the picture that you have to consider. And so just take everything with a grain of salt. A couple of other numbers just um, you know, to be helpful. Um, Georgia Tech admitted the percent admitted with scores 22% without scores 10%. Um, Colgate, it, percent admitted with scores 25%, without scores 12%. You know, you're seeing halved admit rates there. Um, at Emory, 17% admit rate with scores, 8.6% without. So you can see, you know, yeah. um, and you'll see also like when you saw the, um, the press releases last spring for the admitted classes, a lot of the places that released these numbers or similar kinds of numbers would say, you know, 50% of our admit, 50 of the pool didn't submit scores and 53% of our admitted students didn't submit scores. A lot of the places that were able to kind of give a number more like that put published it in their press releases. But again, you have to really dig deep and say, how does this apply to me in my situation with my profile? Um, but I hope that those numbers, while you know, are, are instructive in some way, but 
as I said before, if you can, you want to give scores and good scores relative to the school and good scores relative to a school are like in that upper part of their mid 50%, not smack in the middle of it, um, but on the upper end or outside of it, um, particularly for selective and highly selective schools. So being that testing is still obviously really, really important, Sasha, how do you continue to improve upon it? How can one improve upon their scores? Yeah, I was just talking to some um, high schoolers about this and yeah. bring the test down um, into the three components I see as sort of what a child needs to address depending on where they are in order to sort of master these tests or to reach their goals. Um, and so the three categories as I see them, the first is what I call content and skills, right? Like a fourth grader can't take the ACT. You do need your algebra. You do need geometry. You do need to read at a certain level. Like there are grammar rules and that is category one. And, and, and every kid has something to address there, even if it's that they forgot an exponent rule or a little comma rule. And some kids have a lot more to address there. Although I think overwhelmingly our kids think the work is to be done there. And mostly they come from these amazing schools and they have skills that are generally really actually above what they need in order to reach their goals. Um, but there are other categories to address which, which make that content and those skills um, difficult. So that's category one. And we always address that sort of first, right? You have to shore up the grammar rules and make sure the math is there. Um, category two is what I call processes and procedures. You know, I think these tests are like languages and every single piece has a pattern, um, big and small. So there are types of questions and types of answer choices and types of passages and every single type and every single piece of the test really should have a corresponding process that works every time. So every time I see a variable in the answer choice, every time I see a verb, underlined every time I see the fiction passage. And those every times can, again, be big and small, depending on if it's a timing question, which is sort of bigger, or if it's an answer choice trap. But developing and scaffolding those patterns allows the child to use the content and skills that they mostly already have to navigate this very foreign language that is very decipherable, um, should you have the tools to speak it. Um, and then once category one is amazing and we know our verb rules and we've also uh, learned our processy for making sure that those verbs are all right. We still have to address category three, which I think is really under addressed by a lot of educators, which is what I call performance. Ultimately, this is a performance and you have to go in and do it on that day. And so doing it at home with your mom, baking muffins feels different and doing it, um, you know, when the proctor messes up on the real game day can really be a difficult challenge. And so um, addressing what the obstacles to performance are, like for some kids it's anxiety, right? But for other kids it's boredom or um, distractibility or whatever it is. There's they're so, um, they're, they're sort of make or break when it comes to taking those first categories, right? And so we really address that category as we get closer and closer to official testing. We start to break down what are the feelings and thoughts associated with testing? What are the things happening around the child that are um, making it so that they forget everything in category one and two? That's what they usually do. They forget all of category one and two and it's because their brains are really, really stressed and the kid next to them is so annoying with his, tapping pencil and you know the that brain is not great at doing math and so our job as educators is to after one and two are in good shape to really work with the child on normalizing the things that happen inevitably during testing we're not going to get rid of the annoying kid with his pencil we're not going to get rid of the proctor who messes up the timing those things actually will happen you are going to feel feelings during testing, things are going to go wrong, your body might get cold or hot or sick to your stomach or, and so we really help um, inoculate kids in the sense that those are normal. And then what do we do to help our brains get to a place where we can frankly just do the things we already know how to do, which is category one and two. So in terms of moving a raw score, you know, if you have 75 questions on the ACT grammar and you're getting 60 of them right, and we want to move really close to that 75, 
Well, we have to address whatever content's missing in that grammar section. Maybe you have no idea where commas go. And then we have to make sure we're not missing questions because of the foreign language, which is what the ACT is. And then we have to perform. Um, and we address everything from caffeine to food to sleep to um, you know, parents who are mad at us, all the things that make us <laughs> feel things during testing. Um, so that's how we move scores. We address those three categories in a really um, customized way, depending on where a child is in each of those categories. And that moves over the course of, a, of an effective program. And one thing I had from the counseling perspective is that yeah. I don't care what the school gets here. I just need the score to get out of my way so I can do my work. And so whether you get it in October of junior year or October of senior year, like we don't care. And I say that not because we want to extend it, because I think everybody, you know, no offense to Sasha, but this isn't usually the highlight of the process um, for people. But um, so, of course, we want it to finish, you know, more efficiently if possible. But at the end of the day, you're going to hit it when you're going to hit it. And like I said, we just need the score to get out of our way. The best thing you can hope for is that the score is a non-issue. They're going to look at your score. It's strong enough for them that they just move past it. So again, high score is not getting you and not anywhere you wanna go at least, you know, they're not gonna get you in, but the relatively low score can keep you out. And without the score at all, you know, it changes things. It often will change sort of the, the possibility or your chances for admission. So when you see the person next to you at school or you hear people saying, I'm done or I'm taking it now, good for them. It doesn't impact your score and you should not feel the pressure to, to do it sooner. There's no brownie points for like when you score it, it doesn't matter. You just need the score. And, and that's really what you're going for. So take the time to do what you need to do to hit where you're going to hit. And again, people like Sasha will be honest about what the realistic but ambitious ceiling would be for you. And then you know where you should be headed, you know, what your goal is. And we can tell you sort of what's good enough to stop like what we need, you know, to stop. And so don't get caught up. I hear it so often from my students, they get really anxious when friends and classmates are talking about taking the test or certainly being done with the test or whatever they got. But remember that whatever they get and whatever they do has no bearing on your admission and you will not be behind or looked at differently if you pick up your score later rather than earlier. So just a really, really important thing, speaking of the anxiety piece at least. Yeah, and I should note that there's every child has different seasonality. Like some kids have soccer in the fall and they are, don't have time in the fall and other kids play volleyball and whatever that is, that's the spring, I guess. And so everyone has, I mean, and some kids didn't do SATs over the summer because they did an incredible internship that Barry is going to be so happy uh, to have at the end of this game, right? And and they're, and then they did something else with that time. So the time that kids put into this, and I think that's the other thing about the planning is like, it's the biggest thing is putting in the right amount of time at the right time. And doing it too early isn't right. And doing it for too long isn't right. And that's why that careful planning makes sense. And also taking the test over and over again is also not right, right? We have purposeful, intentional testing. We're going for a concise testing portfolio. We are not taking this test over and over and over again, um, at least the, not the real one. Um, and then our kids, usually what usually what happens is they reach their goal and then they, they move the goal. Barry does it too. They go, it's a 34. And then Barry's like, how about a 35? And they go, yeah, how about a 35? And then what we do is we pause because it's the end of junior year and they've got the 34 and they finish it up and then they come back to it in the fall on their own without a lot of pressure and they end up going for this. So there's also a rhythm to these things where, where kids have to do it at the right sort of um, moment for them. The most promising testing season for me, and I always say like, I'm as a counselor, like I'm walking into the fire with you at the end, right? Like we're walking in together with everyone else kind of waving us well, you know, good wishes and, and wishing us well. Um, but we're walking in fire and out with you. And so I have to be optimistic, but realistic about what we're going to have to work with at the end. I am consistently optimistic about fall of senior year testing. I just consistently see meaningful pops on both the SAT and the ACT when students pause at the end of junior year, do nothing for the prep over the summer, come back, do a little um, shop because everyone's rusty 
and come in clean, a little older, a little wiser, less anxious, knowing it's the last hurrah, and we get meaningful bumps. I'm thrilled to get them in September, October. Bring it on. Like whenever it, it can come, we're happy to do it, and it comes so much easier. So again, think long term. And if we can get it done a little sooner, fantastic. And to Sasha's point about timing, sometimes it's something more external, like a sport or a commitment or whatever. And sometimes like, listen, these are standardized tests for chronological age. Some people are just going to hit their peak a little later, like everything else in life. You know, people are hitting that point at different points. And so some people just need a little more time for no other reason than they need a little bit more time to get to their goal. And that's okay too. Again, we just need to get there. And so, you know, really think about what's best for you. And then we plan accordingly a testing schedule. And of course, every time scores come back, we assess and make sure that this, that what we planned was right. And if, do we need to make any changes? Can't you tell we love planning? Barry and I love planning. We think everything <laughs> is a plan at the beginning and it's you just write planning. Yeah, that's beautiful, right? That's what's, that's a big part of what takes the stress out of it, right? That puts you in control. It, you know, there's so much about this process that you actually can control. People think of the process as happening to them. It's the furthest thing. You have so much control of what your options will be, but you've got to take a deep breath. You've got to look at the process. You've got to plan for you. Don't worry again about what other people are doing. Plan for you. And you can really stay ahead of the process really the whole time too, which also brings the stress down. I think people get especially anxious when they hear someone talking about something. Oh, wait, did I miss that? I didn't know about that piece or I didn't think about this. But you can avoid all of that, you know, with, with proper planning. And right. it's Amazing. How, um, besides obviously your scores, how can a student genuinely demonstrate to school that she or he would be a very good fit for that school? And part of the question is, if in particular, if you haven't visited campus, but I think this is a really good question when thinking about an application for any school, how can you demonstrate that you are a good fit? So this is a fantastic question and it's so timely because it's the story of my life right now um, because I'm in the midst of like essay, <laughs> this um, as we move towards this big November 1 deadline. And so it's very fresh in my mind how often students do not do a good job of demonstrating it, even when they have visited. So I understand the idea of without visiting, it seems a bit harder. But if it makes you feel any better for those of you who haven't been able to get to some campuses, um, students who have visited, students who genuinely love the school that they're applying to early, when it comes to writing the essays and getting through kind of in a more discreet, nuanced way as to why you are a fit, it's extraordinarily hard. And we go through many drafts with students to help them understand the vibe of the place, how admissions tends to read applications in one school versus another that are, you know, in many ways very similar, and how you can communicate your story and parts of you in an authentic way that kind of naturally vibes with what they tend to favor in their reading process. And so it is about visiting, but I will tell you that over and over again, students visit, but they're not gonna get like really, really what we need to get at for truly good supplemental essays because there's a misconception. People know they need to be tailored fine, but the, the perception is that I'm interested in biology, which I'm not, but whatever, but I'm interested in biology and I did this and that in biology to show you that I really am interested and think it's fascinating or I'm passionate about it. And then you have this great lab and this professor is doing this research and see, we're a great fit. We're a great match. And it, like, that's like the least you can do. Like what less could you do than that? And if you're showing up to apply, of course, I have an interest. They have a resource that matches it. Pretty much anybody could show up and say, I'm interested in X and you guys have something or other to match. Your job isn't to tell them like that you match with one of their wealth of resources. Your job is to compel them to pick you amongst equally qualified applicants, thousands, sometimes more than 10,000 of them and to pick you to be able to take advantage of their wonderful resources. So I think this perception of like the match versus fit 
Those are two very different things. And just matching is not, is not gonna get you anywhere good um, or certainly anywhere like, you know, that you wouldn't be able to get regardless. And so knowing these schools and what they're about and what they're looking for and communicating it in a very discreet way. You don't want to be the kid that's like, I'm a creative thinker. I think creatively, you know, University of Chicago looks for creative intellectual thinkers and that's exactly how I am. It's like, mm, not the best approach, right? They know who they are. You don't need to tell them. You have to show them in a discreet way. And you have to know what each places are looking for. Chicago is an easy, an easy example, um, but most of them are not. And how they're different from their peers, you know, how do you write differently for Williams, Amherst, Swarthmore? How do you write differently for Harvard, Yale, Princeton? How do you write differently for Tulane, Miami, and Penn State? You know, you'd better be writing differently for them, but, you know, we work with students to really help them understand, and they go through maybe a few more drafts than they want to, but the importance of those supplemental essays, like, I can't overstate it, like just how important they are in the fit um, determination, which is ultimately how decisions are made. Very specific question having to do with applications. If twins are applying to the same, some of the same schools for the same major, one su submits scores and one does not, what is the impact on admissions? So there's a lot of it depends in this question. So it depends on if you're applying to schools that even admit by major for that for first and foremost. It depends. Sometimes they don't admit, oftentimes they're not admitting by major. They might admit by school. And this would be again a large, typically a larger school, though some medium-sized schools certainly fall into this category. And the third and most important one is what's their twin policy? So some schools will have a policy where they will not split twin decisions, meaning if there are twins that are applying in the same year, they're gonna give the same decision to both kids. More often than not, places will split. And so they'll give different decisions to twins if that's what's, if that's what's called for. And so I think really what you need to know is for the schools that you're looking at, um, what's their twin policy with regard to split decisions? And then, um, also, what's the relative strength of each twin, right? For whether, if it is by major and they're admitting by major for their respective major, is one strong and one's weak, but is it a major that's more impacted like oftentimes a business might be um, versus something else? So there's so many, like it depends, um, but hopefully that's helpful in thinking about some of the different factors that you need to think about in assessing. And the answer for that question will be different depending on the school that you're asking the question for. Um, you'll get some places where you'll say it's, you know, one way or the other, somewhere the stronger twin will lift the potentially weaker twin. Um, and plenty of places that will split the decision, which I feel like you must not have ever lived with a high school student during this process if you're splitting decisions between twins. But I get <laughs> there are many of the, there are many twins, sets of twins, so much space and there are schools that used to not split decisions and now do because it's gotten so competitive and I get it, but I don't, I don't want to be there when it happens. No, no, not at all. Um, where do you see AP tests heading in the next several years now that SAT subject tests have ceased to exist? You know, I'll just jump in and say AP exams were never a huge part of this process. Okay. Um, okay. And, and, and I don't, I, I see parents worrying or hoping they'll be a bigger part because there aren't the subject tests, but that hasn't been my experience. Um, you know, my experience is that for students taking AP courses, right, which are offered still at many um, high schools, um, taking the AP exam and doing well on it is the period at the end of the sentence. It's expected, it's part of the course, and 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 we really do, and uh, those students aren't always thinking about this, they really do often some get credit once they get to school, which can be actually a huge benefit to get college credit going into freshman year. But it's never been a big part of admissions. It's, it's never really even been a part of admissions in any substantial way. And I, and I imagine it's going to continue to be um, a smaller part of the curricula from the high schools. That's what I've seen over the last 10 years is that it's become um, sort of less uh, prominent in the high schools, although there are certainly schools who still do AP courses. Yeah, I think, you know, like Sasha said, that more and more high schools are abandoning AP. 
If you're in a school that has AP and you're taking AP classes, you sh and again, it depends what kind of schools you're shooting for, but you should plan to take the AP exams and hopefully you'll be able to get fives and fours. And the more selective the school, the more there should be fives than fours and you would never show a three. Um, there are some schools where you could show the three, but they're not gonna matter so much at those places anyway. And typically what it, you know, a student who's doing well in the class will get a good score, at least if you're gonna show the score, right? Um, and there are some places that are going to be a little bit more like that are going to be more uh, sticklers about like if they see an AP class, they're going to kind of be looking for that AP score to go along with it. So nobody's stupid when they see you take five APs, but there's only three scores. They know you've not shown a couple of them for a reason. So I think you need to be thoughtful about that. But AP exams by themselves, sometimes I have students whose schools don't offer APs and both before the subject tests were gone and after will say, should I take the AP exam, you know, even though I'm not taking like the actual AP class. And I always have said like, why in the world would you, um, you know, like if you're in the class, then yes, you should take, you should take the exam and, and do well, especially again, the more selective the school, the more I would say that's important um, and not important because it's gonna make or break. It's just expected that if you're taking the class that you will have taken the exam at the end and you will have done well, you know, not surprising from an Ivy League school or like a highly selective small liberal arts college, right? Um, but the, 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 the tests themselves as a proxy for subject tests, you know, subject tests are gone because they were irrelevant and obsolete before they were officially killed. So, um, you know, that was something where even before they were completely canceled and, 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 and discontinued, that when colleges said they're recommended but not required, I would have to convince people like truly, like they're really like, if you can do well, we'll submit them. If they're more than like a little bit of work for you and they're going to take you away from your grades or your SAT or ACT, like don't sweat it, we don't need it. Um, with the exception, of course, of Georgetown, which is always the exception. Um, but, you know, and so they really, it, you, the, the point is, is that they weren't having much meaning or impact. And so college board said, you know, we don't even, they don't want them. Um, and so we are not looking for something in its place, you know, exactly the opposite, in fact. And if you can see, if anything, they're, they're putting a de-emphasis on some of this testing, um, not, not looking for something else. So do you need to, not necessarily for the AP, APs, but you kind of talked about submitting scores, not submitting your scores. Um, for the SAT and the ACT, do you need to submit all your scores? Do the schools see everything? Yeah, so I always tell parents, you know, ultimately you have a lot of control over your scores. Um, you have to actually pay to send them, <laughs> of course, as part of this process. Um, and um, you release them to the schools. Now. Um, I, that doesn't mean you should be testing uh, when you're not ready or not comfortable. And there are ways um, with the college board, should you have a really bad day to cancel your scores and, and make sure. So there's a lot of safety nets and there's a lot of control. There are schools that ask you to show everything. Um, and uh, obviously that's something that you will also wanna talk to your high school counselor about, your college counselor about at school, um, because it's not always uh, strategically wise to send everything and that's why I think it's so important to plan and make sure that kids are sitting and testing when they should um, and with the ACT uh, you can delete your scores whenever you want so kids really like that um, they really can just get rid of them completely um, and that's honestly ultimately psychological <laughs> it's okay if it just sits in your college board account but psychology matters to teenagers and, and the ability to kind of like wipe the slate clean versus having that that score you don't like sitting there looking at you when you see your nice scores. Some kids really prefer that. Um, so that's my sort of big picture answer. Barry, you want to? Yeah, you know, I mean, there's so many pieces to it. So like uh, everything that Sasha said, I agree with, you know, you do have a lot of control over the scores that you send. Again, it really depends on where you're applying. Is the school place that super scores? Do they allow just self-reporting? Are you going to self-report on the common app? Plus you have to send the official scores, which means they will see all sections from a particular test date. But if they only require self-reporting during the admissions review, there's a different strategy. So it depends, like everything else in this process, what are your scores? What's the, what are the section scores we're looking at? 
what's the reporting and self-reporting policy at the particular school? What school are we talking about? Um, what are the scores relative to the rest of your profile? I mean, you have to do this for each of your schools and make the, make the call as to what am I gonna do? Um, but you really do, the ultimate message is that you have a, a lot of control. And I do think a very important point from the counseling perspective is that you don't just keep going in just to say, hey, it's practice, I'll just go in and I'll just use the scores I want. You will find yourself in a tough spot with regard to having to show, you know, I just was having this conversation with somebody last night where, and they didn't take the test, you know, so many times, they took it three, but there was an issue where one of the section scores is lo very low for the place that she's looking at. And I just don't want them to see it. And so they're just going to see not the highest section of that, the one point off, but it's much better off. And so even though we could have shown a high one point higher on a different section, I don't want them to see that much lower score on the science section. And so it's really, really particular. And you don't want to sit there and have extra tests where you're like, oh, my composite is this if I use this date, which then will hurt me because they're going to have to see this. So really be deliberate about when you take the test. And Barry brought up super scoring, which is like yeah, that exactly. big mixing and matching of scores across different test dates to give you your super score. And, um, you know, I guess like Barry and I agree that we're always going for concise and we're never relying on super scoring. I'm never going into a program being like, let's game it and get a really, and, and we always want consistency from test to test. We're never showing them highs and lows or anything that will distract them. And so I guess I think of super scoring for the colleges who even allow it, which some don't, don't super score, but I see it as like an added extra thing that we might use down the line, but it's never a starting point. It's a, oh, look, we do have really amazing SAT scores from two dates. Both are strong. Barry likes both of them, but the super score is higher and the college super scores. Yes, you're going to do that. But in, in, in lots of um, situations, you're just going to set one amazing set of scores. And that's my ideal, um, though it's not always, you know, the, the most important thing. It just depends on the school and the kid. And what is self-reporting? For those that don't know, so self-reporting means. So it used to be until you know, it's um, hard. It's hard for me with the pandemic. So my timelines like give or take eighteen months. Everybody <laughs> so in the couple of years before the pandemic. So in the last four years, which sounds longer than it's been. Um, some colleges started moving towards instead of where it used to be that you always had to send your official score report directly from the testing agency as part of the admissions process. So official scores from the SAT or from the ACT. Um, now you can just self-report on the Common App. There is a testing section on the Common App that asks you to list your scores. That's always been there and it's always been an optional section as it is today. But it used to be that in addition, that was part of the credentials, just like recommendations and transcripts that had to be sent to the colleges. But colleges have dialed that back. Um, some of them before the pandemic, many more of them since the pandemic when they went test optional as well, to say students can just self-report. You self-report on the Common App, meaning you enter in your scores on the Common Application. You do not have to send official scores from the testing agency at that time. But ultimately, if you are admitted and you decide to enroll, they will require you to send your official scores at that time as a verification process. So they wanna make sure that whatever you self-reported um, obviously was accurate. And of course they'll check against it and wouldn't hopefully find any discrepancy. And it would just be kind of like with your final transcript, part of the, you know, just kind of official finalization of your admission. And so there's a difference there. The other thing to know is that it has also changed like in the last two years um, on the Common App, it used to have self-reporting and you would list each date and you would list the section scores. Now, this year on the Common App, it actually only asks for your best scores from each section. So even when you're, when you're self-reporting, you're not actually showing every section from each date. You're just showing the best one. So you need to check with each of your schools whether self-reporting by itself is sufficient or if they need or want um, official scores as well during the admissions process versus at the end. But self-reporting simply means you're allowed to report it on the application and they'll count as official scores for the purposes of review until they're verified at a later date. 
Um, do you think we should open it up to questions or did any questions come in? Yeah, we have a couple of questions that came in. Um, one question is, do you think that the test optional policy will stay in future years? Um, short answer, I do. I don't think everywhere. Um, but I would say mo a majority of the places that are test optional probably will stay test optional. Again, of a certain level or caliber of school or selectivity level, that's another story. Um, but I do think that most places will keep test optional. But again, test optional technically for who, right? Um, so I, I think it's a hard, some places will absolutely dial it back and a couple of places did so this year even. But it's hard to dial back. And the truth is, is it's... Um, it's quite beneficial to the institution to keep it. And um, they're usually making decisions with that in mind. And so uh, for their own benefit and purposes, it, it makes sense to keep it. And it also benefits some students too, for sure. And so I think both the, the fact that it's a little harder to dial back once they've done it, it gives them so much more freedom and flexibility to read holistically and to bring in the kind of class they wanna bring that um, it will be hard for them to say uh, no to it. But some places will for sure um, come back, but I don't think most places will. And then let's see, hold on. There's other questions that are in some other places. Give me a second. Um, well, while you're, while you're looking, Sasha, um, how do you address students that are struggling with their grades when you're, this was, yeah, you know, again, I think that diagnosis process, like going really uh, carefully through that is is really important. We spend a lot of time figuring out what the actual problem is. Um, for some kids, that's an issue with the teacher or the way that the class is structured. For other children, there are fundamental concepts that have been missing a long time um, and have been built on and, and now we're in a mess. Uh, for other students, it's how they take the test. The concepts are perfect and then they go in and they don't finish the exam or they don't uh, they make careless errors. So, I mean, I think every child um, has a number of things that make, different, make certain classes and certain things difficult that all converge. And some kids, um, you know, really need um, more time than others to uh, build certain skills um, that maybe their classmates have. So I think the first thing is to figure out what it really is. What's really the problem? And you know, some some parents say, "What if my kid just isn't motivated?" And I guess I feel like they're always motivated for something. They may not be motivated for the grade and calculus. They may not be motivated for what you think, but there's always something they want. And sometimes it's just for you to be happy as their parent. And sometimes it's to get into a good school. And sometimes it's to get their homework done more easily because they hate it. Um, but whatever it is, we really try to get at what does that kid really want? And then, you know, we meet them there. And my tutors are these amazing kids who, I mean, these amazing humans who come and meet with these kids and, and they really do um, meet them without judgment, which I think is unusual for these kids. And they meet them without evaluating them. And then we start to build whatever it is that's missing. So it's a lot like that ACT process. Like, what is it that's really behind um, the scores. What is the why? And then we put together a plan, and then we adjust a million times because the plan needs to adjust as as the child adjusts. And organizational issues. Can you speak to that as well? Too. Yeah. So sometimes um, our students are working in conjunction with a class, right? They're struggling in history and they have executive functioning issues or they have organizational issues. And sometimes the issue is just organization and those programs look differently. Um, but a lot of kids meet with someone on Sundays and then again, maybe on Thursdays. And their, the idea is to create a system for the week to get organized and to help them understand. You know, sometimes we have kids track how long things are going to take how long they think things will take and then how long they actually took. It's very interesting to see who's uh, accurate at that and who's not and which way they go. Um, but a lot of times our, our, our tutors are there really to set up those processes that work and to keep them running and to help the child develop them. And sometimes it's kind of 50-50 content um, and, and those sort of skills. Back to you, Barry. Questions? Yes. Okay, I have them up. Um, first question was, are tests looked at in context to their schools, like in the school report, or is it based on city scores or state? 
all scores submitted. And if people continue to only submit high scores and other kids aren't submitting lower scores, aren't the numbers more and more inflated? Yes, um, that for that last part. That's one of the other benefits um, to the institution is that their average ACT and SAT goes up when they're test optional because the people submitting scores are the ones that are submit typically are choosing because they're higher. Um, and so just like I mentioned earlier, you know, statistics are instructive, but you've got to dig into them a little bit more. And that's one way, um, absolutely, like with regard to averages. And you'll see uh, that in comparison to the year prior, whether it's the post-COVID test optional or you look at schools that went test optional pre-COVID, if you look at their average scores the year prior and then in the first year of test optional, not surprisingly, they go up um, the same way the application numbers go up and the admit rate goes down. So yes, as far as how tests are looked at in context, the truth is, is at the end of the day, um, everything is looked at in context. And again, it depends on, you know, what, where you are in the pool, but generally speaking, no, they are not taking SAT scores and saying, well, this person comes from this particular school or that particular state. They are, there is an element of that when they're reading holistically, um, especially for students who are in circumstances that are like, you know, clear or that there might not be access or, or where they expect there absolutely would be access to test prep or whatever. So there is a little bit of that, but at the end of the day, it's not moving the needle for many people in the pool. So look at those middle 50% ranges as an instructive thing. Don't look at the whole thing and be like, oh my God, I'm close to the bottom, I'm in there. You know, like that's probably doesn't mean you have a great chance of getting in. Um, use the upper end as a, as a gauge. And, and remember that just because you're in the upper end doesn't mean you're getting in. It just means that the, if you submit the score, it's not gonna likely knock you out. Um, and so there is a little bit of context, but I don't think based on what you're saying here or with the way that this question is asked, not with the level of specificity and detail that you might be hoping. Um, you know, they're just looking at their national pool, what their kind of averages are, what they're looking for in the context of each individual applicant. And that has less to do with the particularities of the school, the city, the state, and more just a general demographic context. Um, another question that we got is, do you have uh, any geographical details on those test optional statistics where in California and test facilities have been very hard to access? Some people have traveled out of state to take the test, but others find that unsafe or illogical comments. Um, I don't have geographic um, data and not surprisingly, the colleges haven't offered it. Um, they're just giving these general statistics if they're even releasing certain bits of information at all. Not surprisingly, plenty of them release no information about this. And so um, I do know that California has been a bit trickier and you know, there, certainly if there is some context and if you're in a place where it has been very difficult to access testing, I would ask the school counselor to mention this in their letter. Um, you can mention it in additional information or even in the COVID question, but I think it, something like that is best, um, best comes from a counselor at school, not the student saying I couldn't access it. You can say that, but get the counselor to kind of corroborate that it's actually been very difficult um, to access. And, um, and yeah, and there have been other places where it's been hard kind of throughout the year, as Sasha said, even, even like before in the spring of 2020, by the time it was fall, even for those kids last year, all of them um, were able, the ones that wanted to and needed to, all of them were able for us were able to take the exams. And this year, there was really no issue at all. So if there really is something in your area, I would say have school address that um, if you need to. Or not, right? I mean, it depends that not putting scores in for a particular place needs an, an explanation necessarily. And so that's also another piece. Um, another question. Is your advice generally to omit scores if they are not in the upper middle and take a chance because of lower score would take you out altogether, but no score may result in admit, even if the chances are less based on the stats. So, you know, again, it depends on like what your overall profile looks like relative to the scores, um, what your fit is. You could have everything in line, but if it's a place that like wouldn't likely kind of respond to your profile or find a profile like yours compelling from a fit perspective, like it's kind of a moot point. So I think it depends. Um, 
you know, I would say that if you're not in the upper end generally, and again, you want to be as close to that upper end or outside of it for the more selective the school is, if you're looking at a place that's even more somewhat moderately selective, maybe you don't have to be up right at the top, but you still don't want to be like in that bottom half of the middle 50%. Um, but it really does depend. I think if you can give them, you know, what we would say good scores, again, hard to say when we're talking generally here, that you want to do that, but you'll have to kind of assess what would be my chances, speak to a, a knowledgeable counselor, what would be my chances if I submitted this score to this school with these breakdowns, by the way, that's another piece of it, um, with my you know, academic profile, with my extracurricular level of things and what we think I can communicate in my essays and what do you think the chances are without the scores? Um, and that's a strategic decision that you'll make. And it might be different and it likely would be different if you're thinking about this, depend on some of your schools and others. You know, we had multiple students last year, everything, every student, who went test optional last year, or maybe almost every, let's just be careful because there might've been one I'm not realizing, but almost every one of them um, did different things depending where we were in their list. And some places we submitted, some places we didn't, that was fairly typical. And it was a strategic decision in every instance. Um, and I think if I'm looking everywhere, that might be. And we're actually, oh, actually, we're running out of time. There are a couple of others here. Oh, wait, one more. I'll take one more. We have a, just a few minutes before we end. Um, have recently learned of an organization that works with students to, quote, found a not-for-profit to exist for a short period of time while such applicant is applying. This seems pretty disingenuous. Are schools seeing through this or some that actually buy into this? You know, listen. I think at the end of the day, it's kind of hard. It's hard to really tr effectively BS enough through it. You can BS to some degree for sure. Um, but usually when you're writing about these things in the essays, which is where you see the substance, if you really haven't done much, like it's gonna be hard to stand out against, remember the people who actually did do stuff. Um, and on the activities grid, you're not getting that much mileage from it anyway. I think also this idea of like founding an organization is so like 1993 when I was applying where that by itself would have been really like impressive and a big deal, but not that you shouldn't potentially do it, but things like that, like just, oh, I founded an organization by itself doesn't really do anything for anybody. So it's always going to be no matter what activity you're talking about, like, okay, like what was the substance behind it? And remember, you've got people gunning for the same spot as you are who actually have done a lot. And you can imagine that their essays are probably going to be stronger than the kid who really is truly doing it for, you know, a short period of time. Might some people slip through the cracks? Sure. Is it a good plan A? Absolutely not. Um, you know, but do the best you can and do the things that are going to be substantive and, you know, that you'll be able to communicate the kinds of things that um, the folks on the other side are expecting to see. Hopefully we can encourage our kids to do things they're really passionate about because that both helps them in this admissions process, but also that's the kids we want. We want to raise our kids that way anyway. Uh, whether or not some kids look through the cracks. Of course, all of those things I hope go without saying, but um, extracurricular activities are really where you have full reign to do what you want. Like you can't do that on your, what your course selection, you know, you can't do that with the scores and say, yeah, I don't want to take this test. So I'm just not going to take it since it's test optional. This is actually the one place where you get to choose what you focus on. Now, granted, you want to take it to a certain level and to a certain depth, depend, especially mindful of that, depending on what standard strong is at the kinds of schools you're looking at, because you don't want to be standard for any school you're applying to, because you'll get knocked out pretty quickly. But that aside, what you do is really entirely up to you. And so like, what's, who needs that? Like, you know what I mean? There's no need for it. Um, you know, even if you're thinking, you know, oh, maybe this would be a, an easy and quick way, just do something you enjoy. Your essay will be better. Um, you'll be happier. You're not going to get so much out of that anyway. So I don't, I don't really see that as, um, as worth the time, honestly. Um, and then Oh, we just got a question. Hold on one second. There's what it's, uh, we're just at, it's, and I have to hand yeah. it over to. to yeah. Well, well I, I, you know what? 
Go ahead. Sorry, Sorry. Just to say that Barry has has so clearly demonstrated how important it is the individual of each of these things. So you know you can eat with a you'll get an email with the the recording, but Barry and I email us, and if you have questions about your individual child, that's when we start to dig in. And I, to both of you, and I hope everybody listening in also just really really gets your positive energy. You're, you know, you want to take the stress level down, you want to make it as enjoyable a process and to each individual and what their needs are and, and a, a credit to both of you. Thank you, Leslie. Thanks so much for Thanks, moderating. Leslie. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> um, for those of you joining live, you will get a recording. And, um, and for those of you who are listening after, thank you for joining us. And good luck to everybody in this cycle. We'll be back at you with updates throughout the cycle. So look out for announcements for future webinars. We'll be downloading on the early decision and early action numbers. You'll see us in the spring. Um, we'll be here to talk everything through and to give you up-to-date info. So good luck to everybody.